diligently seeking. My name is Daniel Vallis and welcome to our channel. We are on a learning journey, learning so much and as we go forward the Lord shows us more and more of the tapestry of redemption and the patterns and everything that's coming together. He gives more wisdom and insight, more knowledge too, as we go forward in faith. We have seen so much that has initially caught our attention. Celestial signs that were given to catch our attention and to remind us of patterns and stories and shadows that are in scripture so that when we see the signs, it automatically sparks interest of, hey, that reminds us of something that we have seen in scripture. And particularly with the Star of Bethlehem Echo reminder signs that we saw last year, there were things that we saw happen in the heavens untouched by man that we know reminded us of biblical patterns connected even with the prophetic coming of Christ. And so we have seen events that initially caught our attention and as we have followed those events and started to follow the breadcrumb trail, so to speak, as we've gone out and looked for the king, which we were reminded of by these celestial signs, just like the wise men, we have gone forward on an incredible learning journey a treasure hunt, looking into the depths of God's word, finding out incredible patterns, how they go with each other, learning more about what we're seeing, what we have been shown, and even given new insight and knowledge about things we had made note about that we had seen before. Celestial events that we had seen before connected with some of the things we saw coming together. We took notes on those, and as we go forward and we get more and more clues coming together, we can see, ah, this is how they come together. And so we are on a treasure hunt, but as we go forward, we get more knowledge, more insight, and we can start to see how it comes together more and more. And it also informs us more of why the enemy is on the lookout as well. Hebrews 11.6 But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. This is what we are called to do at this time. Diligently seek him. Not just casually seek him, not just seek him with a morbid curiosity. No, we are called to diligently seek him. When we see signs and patterns and prophetic signs as well and events that tell us that he is to be expected and that the day is drawing nigh, then we should be diligently seeking him. Not just half-heartedly, not lukewarmly, but diligently seeking him. And notice that God promises us he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And we got to keep this in mind as we go forward. This treasure hunt has taken a lot longer than we expected, but we've learned so much. We found so many treasures and nuggets along the way. We have fistfuls full of treasure that we have already seen and learned that has deepened the richness of our relationship and fellowship with God. We've learned more about the tapestry of our own redemption. We've seen more of the handiwork of God. In so many ways, just being on this treasure hunt for this past year and a half, we have learned and garnered so much that has blessed us in so many ways. But we also know from scripture here that he's going to be a rewarder one day in eternity of them that diligently seek him. God wants us to seek him. And he has a treasure hunt. He wants to see who is really serious about him. You know, there are times here in our life that we go through different circumstances and situations where we find out who our real friends are, who really cares about us. And in a sense, that's what a lot of this testing by the treasure hunt is. God wants to see who is really going to diligently seek him. Who is really serious about God? You see, someone who's just along for the ride, just for casual, morbid curiosity, or just wants to hear dates or something, they won't pursue God diligently. They'll give up. They'll quit when things don't meet their expectations or things start getting hard. But someone who is serious about God, who has a heart to follow God and to be closer to God and desires to see his face, will diligently press on going forward. And God promises that he will reward them that diligently seek him. He doesn't say that he's going to reward only those who put together some massive puzzle piece and figure it all out. No, he says them that diligently seek him. That's what he's looking for. Who is interested in pursuing and finding out God and the treasure map of the prophetic events and signs that he has scattered throughout scripture and time and with events lately too as well? He wants to see who is actually paying attention. Who is serious about his word? And looking forward to seeing him. Who's going to rise up? Who is going to go out to meet the bridegroom? Those who are diligent. And they will be rewarded. Blessed are those servants whom he finds watching. Watching involves a amount of time you're going to have to spend 
time on it. And this is the whole idea of buying oil. It's going to cost us something to watch, to diligently seek him. It's going to take our time, time that we could have spent on other activities. It's going to take our focus. It's going to take our energy. It's going to take our soul, our spirit, our passions, our mind, all of us to diligently seek him. And that is the first and great commandment anyway. And he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. No matter where we are on our treasure hunt, we can always look back and know that God will reward us for seeking him. All of our stumbling around and going through the scenic route and all that, it will be rewarded one day. It's not in vain. And we are drawing closer and closer to him and we see so much coming together and we know that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And so we keep this in mind as we go forward. Let's be diligent. Let's be serious. Let's go out to meet the bridegroom diligently seeking him. Now it's really interesting in this passage, Hebrews eleven six, that phrase, of them that diligently seek. That's actually all one word in the Hebrew. And it has the idea of to search out, to investigate, to crave, to demand, to worship. Investigate. This is what we are doing. We are searching out. We are seeking. We are diligently seeking. This isn't just casually looking. No, this is investigating. We are doing a full-blown investigation. We're going to do research. We are going to do our homework. We're going to spend time. We are going to crave and demand finding the bridegroom. Just like the wise men, they went on their journey asking the question, where is he that is born king of the Jews? They investigated. They craved to see the king. They demanded. They wanted the answers. And we can go before the throne of God and we can ask for wisdom as we go forward on this journey too. As we investigate, as we learn more, we are going to be learning and investigating till he comes back. Till the day and moment he comes back, we're going to be learning more. Seeking him until he comes back. And he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Those that crave him. Those that demand and want to know more about him. And this is what drives us forward. Is a desire to be close to him. But then looking back on the journey of things we've been shown before, seeing that, seeing the nuggets we have already learned and gleaned, everything that God has already shown us, everything he has already given to us, and we can go forward in faith in the areas we do not know. And that propels us, our faith, we can trust the one who has showed us the signs already, fully expecting that he has a lot more to show us. And that fuels our fire to diligently seek him even more, wanting to know what else does he have to show us. And so we find ourselves right now at an incredible time with multiple prophetic signs going on right now, celestial signs coming together, geopolitical events happening. We even see the enemy very zealous in these past month and a half, December and November really, of when they really kicked into high gear with a lot of the patterns of they are diligently seeking him too. But for other reasons, they don't know the day or hour either, remember? So they're having to do their own investigations. And they have a lot more insight onto some of the celestial workings and past history and what everything means than we do. But we're both investigating. And they know this time is very important. We know this time is very important. And we see so much coming together. And again, that fuels our treasure hunt when we can see that the enemy is also seeking out the information that's on the treasure map too. There is a lot coming together and they are looking for the same information, but from a different perspective. And they know this time, this area is very close to where X marks the spot. We are at a threshold time. We're at a crossing place where things are coming together and there is an expectation of a passing over. Now it's getting harder and harder to cram all the information into a way where you could see it all on the screen, but definitely download the timeline from our Google Drive. The link is in the description box. You'll be able to read the timeline a whole lot easier than here on the screen. But let me just zoom in on one area where we're at right now so we can get a better idea. I've tweaked things around just to try to make it a little easier to read and also clarify some of the patterns that are at this time. There is a lot that is being brought to our remembrance Things that were instituted as memorials. Things that were instituted as tokens and remembrances. And they're all coming together here at this time where celestial signs that also hearken to those patterns are coming together as well. And so there's a lot that we have to investigate and pay attention to. And in one way it's good that our investigation has taken a year and a half because there's a lot to learn. And if you are new to this channel, definitely download our shallow booklet. There's a lot to catch up on, but there is a lot that can easily be seen coming together right now. 
We've been looking at the peace and safety, and we've seen a one-year mark for major warnings we heard last year. And we've seen within the past month the enemy re-echoing those same peace and safety calls and putting out new ones. They know this time is very important to a one-year return to those warnings, and they're also putting out new warnings. Just yesterday on December 31st, the new UN Secretary General put out a whole video announcing his first day announcing let's make 2017 a year for peace. Pushing peace again. And on top of all the other peace and safety things with Israel and everything else, there are so many things coming together that we know there is an expectation prophetically that sudden destruction is coming. We have heard so many warnings and even ramped up recently about the calls for peace and safety. And the Bible tells us that means sudden destruction is coming and you should expect other events to happen. We also see the sign of the Son of Man happening at this time too. And this is a concurrent sign that's going on at the same time as the Shiloh sign. It does not mean the Shiloh sign stops. It just means that the sign of the Son of Man is also starting. That picture is also starting. It's a separate sign, but there is an overlap. And we talked about in our recent videos that 38 weeks would be the average for a virgin pregnancy. But there's quite a variation in the due dates, and so we got to keep that in mind. It's not uncommon to be several days early, several days late. And so we can't pin down the exact day of when the conception would start. It could be from 37 weeks to 39 weeks, really. All we know is the Bible tells us that she gave birth in the time expected. So apparently her pregnancy was not outside of the range of normal. But when you also consider there is a range of what is considered normal, we just keep in mind that that pregnancy picture is starting around here somewhere. And the average would have been around December 30th, 31st. But still, you can go up to a week before that and a week after that. But all that means is that pregnancy picture rehearsal is starting. And it's interesting when we consider the Shiloh sign, how it overlaps with the sign of the Son of Man. We talked about how we are reminded that we're at a time right now 43 weeks from when we saw Jupiter at opposition which really kicked off the Shiloh sign, timing-wise and astronomically. And it just reminded us, we can't go too far on this, but it just was very interesting to see the pregnancy lengths we are called the sons of God. And Paul the Apostle likened himself to being born out of due time, and he was the Apostle to the Gentiles. So there's some carryover there. And it's just interesting to see that we're at a time of 43 weeks from Jupiter at opposition. And 43 weeks is considered a late pregnancy. And usually today, by the time you get to 43 weeks, they want to induce labor um, because that is seen as late. But again, it's still not abnormal. There's still plenty of natural birth pregnancies that happen at 43 weeks. So it's just interesting to see how we have two lengths of expected pregnancy lengths overlapping at this time and coming together, reminding us of both aspects and who we are born of and what pregnancy picture is going to be starting soon. A lot of interesting pictures coming together, and it's amazing to see how they overlap. And we've talked about the Shiloh sign and how it will continue until the next opposition. The scepter will not move until the next opposition, even though the pregnancy rehearsal sign is going to start within that context. Now, when we zoom out and just look at some of the things that have been coming together here, there is a lot to always keep in mind, but it's amazing when we look at this crossing place where we're at right now and just remember where are we on our treasure hunt, on our learning journey. As we go out to diligently seek him, we are at a time where we still have questions, but we're also at a time with very high expectation when we see the celestial signs and the shadows and patterns coming together at this time. And especially when we consider the pattern of the wise men who also diligently went out to seek him. When we consider our journey, Going back to the time of the first star of Bethlehem, which caught the world's attention, caught a lot of Christians' attention of, hey, that reminds us of the signs that related to the coming of Christ, the coming of the Messiah. And that celestial event happened a year and six months ago, in just a few days plus. But that was the first celestial sign that caught our attention and really kicked off our journey is when we saw that first star and celestial sign appear, particularly reminding us of the events related and reminding us about Christ's first coming. And it should catch our attention that the length of our journey, it feels long, and it has been long, but it's approximately the exact same length of time that the wise men's journey took. And we can look at their journey and use this to bolster our faith of when we get tired, just think of what the wise men went through. They had a whole lot rougher journey than we do, but they still went forward diligently investigating, seeking, and demanding where is he that is born king of the Jews. 
And this helps propel us on our journey when we can look at their example and their patterns and we can see things that we can learn and apply in our faith journey and our learning journey right now too. And we don't know exactly how long it took them to get there, but we do know that it was less than two years. And there's a lot of speculation that it was around one and a half years to include the length of their journey and also some investigation time why they observed the signs. In Matthew 2, 1, down in verse 7, Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. Take note of how scripture emphasizes Herod was looking diligently too. Herod, the enemy, he wanted to investigate. He demanded. He wanted to know the answers too diligently and he inquired of them he he wanted all the facts come on guys tell me when did this star first appear i want to know dates when did you first see the very first sign that led you on your journey i don't want to know when you started on your journey i want to know when did the star appear tell me the date so i can figure out how old this kid is then he says go and search diligently for the young child herod was inquiring diligently and then he emphasized to the wise men that they needed to search diligently for the young child too. Seek diligently for him. Don't give up till you find him. Now notice that he says go and search diligently for the young child. Herod knew and the wise men knew an estimated age of what Christ would be. He would be over a year, maybe around a year and a half, but he was obviously not quite to two years old yet. Matthew 2.16 then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. This should catch our attention in this one story about the wise men going out to seek the king. There's three mentions of diligently seeking, diligently inquiring, diligently investigating to find the king. And he based his understanding of two years old and under according from the time that he learned from the wise men, which related to when they first saw the star. Again, not when they started their journey. When did they see the very first signs of his coming? And so when we take that in consideration with our journey, when did we see the very first sign that really made our ears perk up and say, hey, that reminds us of the king coming? That was the first star of Bethlehem that happened back on June 30th, 2015. And even the world media was talking about it hadn't happened in 2,000 years. So the last time it did happen was around the time of Christ. And here we are seeing it again. It definitely caught our attention. And that is when we would say that the star first appeared for us. That is what started our learning journey. We might not have risen up to the occasion quite as much. But we did notice that is when the star first appeared. That was the first in a series of celestial events that we noticed. And so when we just do some rough calculating of let's take that date, June 30th, 2015. Let's just add two years. That was the high end, just that Herod picked to be super safe of two years. What would two years from that first star appearing be? That would be obviously two years later, June 30th, 2017. So that's on the beyond high end. And we know the wise men would reach the king before that, before two years. But Herod just picked that just to be extra safe and sure, make sure he got them all. Well, let's look at just for curiosity's sake, how much time would it be from that first star appearing to the Revelation 12 sign? That's almost two years, three months. So that's way outside the expected time of expecting the king to come. But when we consider the signs that we saw, just like the wise men, what was the first star that caught our attention that the king was coming and that reminded us of the Messiah and particularly the prophecy of when he came the first time, when Shiloh was born the first time? That was the first star of Bethlehem that we saw back on June 30th, 2015. And our learning journey has been pegged and started from that point. And so when we calculate from that point to where we are now, a time where we have high expectation, we see so much coming together at this threshold and crossing point, we see that we are only one year and six months and then a little bit from that star first appearing, which is right in line with the wise men's pattern. Not close to two years, but somewhere backed off a bit comfortably before two years, right around a year and a half, somewhere around there, 
this is the full expectation. And so this should alert us when we see everything coming together at this crossroad, at this threshold, at this passing over place of seeing, hey, this is about the exact same time that we have an understanding of the wise men's journey being as well. This further bolsters our expectation that, hey, everything seems to be right on track. We should have high expectation at this time of finding the king and going to the king's house, which is what the wise men did. And we know the enemy is doing investigation too. They're diligently seeking to find the day or hour. They have a pretty good idea of the range and time and the celestial events going on. They know this time is very, very important. And particularly Jupiter at opposition and this crossing point they know is extremely important. And it caught my attention how we've been looking at both the Feast of Dedication, the one that's on the biblical calendar of when it would normally scheduled to be, and then also when the Jews observed it on their rabbinical calendar. And it just caught my attention how we were looking at it from the context of the Good Shepherd talking in that context of when he was going to gather the other fold. And we see the enemy messaging a message that spanned exactly both of those and also covered Jupiter in opposition. Again, with the Google Doodle about Jupiter in opposition, they know exactly what celestial time it is. They know what prophetic time it is. And they know this time, and particularly the opposition mark, is extremely important to a bunch of other things. And as we explore all these threads that are connected to it, we can start to see why this time is so important. And we know this time is prophetic from a bunch of other things, but to see the enemy highlighting it and underscoring it and drawing attention particularly to this celestial phenomena at this time, that further tells us that the wolves know this time is very important. And we've been looking at a lot of the threads in the Tapestry of Redemption that are connected to what we saw back at Jupiter's opposition when the Omega portion started. And we've lately been talking about the passing over of Jordan and the two pile of stones, the memorials that were put into place to bring into remembrance patterns and stories and what happened in the past so that those pictures could be brought up in the future for future generations and also for our learning. And it should catch our attention that when Joshua crossed over and they made the memorials, Joshua emphasized that this should remind them of both the crossing of Jordan and of the Red Sea. There's a thread connected to another picture that is remembered with this pattern. And so we have to keep that in mind when we look at this tapestry of redemption. There are certain markers and shadows and pictures that will rehearse certain things, but are also strongly connected to other related patterns and pictures as well that have to be considered with the memorial. Joshua chapter 4, 19 and people came up out of Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you were passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea which he dried up from before us until we were gone over, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you might fear the Lord your God forever. Joshua emphasized to them, remind your children not just of Jordan with this memorial, but also remind them of the connected story of the crossing of the Red Sea. Both these stories go together and remind us of the mighty hand of our God. And so when we are reminded of certain patterns, particularly the crossing over of Jordan and the crossing place celestially and prophetically and time-wise and geographically, we see that they're connected to other things which we have to consider, particularly the crossing of the Red Sea. Now let me zoom out just a little bit here. We're at a time here at the beginning of 2017 where that pattern from opposition that was rehearsed when we were back at that place we see approximately time-wise from that point, the pattern of the crossing of the Red Sea is right around here somewhere. Now, there's a lot of different research of exactly when did they cross the Red Sea. All we can say is it would be approximately right around here somewhere. We don't know exactly how many days it took. But it did not take them long to leave Egypt, the major cities there, and start heading down to the Red Sea, and then they camp there for a day. There's a little bit of travel time in there and camp time in there as well. All we know is they were making some serious time to get as far away from Egypt as possible. So they weren't taking their time, but it would take them time to get down to that area. 
And so an approximate figure is just a few days after actual exodus, which puts that picture right around here somewhere, right at this time of great expectation. And it also with other pictures as well that we are told to all consider together. We are told to consider all these pictures together. All these Passover, all these crossing over pictures are brought to remembrance at a celestial point of crossing over where it marks the strength of the covenant. And of course that reminds us of remembrances and memorials that Christ gave his disciples at this exact same time in relation to these crossing over and passing over timing events. Now, it should also catch our attention that the crossing of the Red Sea in Exodus is being brought to remembrance at this time by a celestial sign that the enemy is even aware of. Okay, so that's being brought to our mind. And then when we look on the calendar, we see that for the scripture reading of this week, where we are at right now, is the chapter about the Exodus. Think about that for a second. A celestial sign reminding us about events that happened several months ago happens to be at a celestial time where it places that reminder to the week of that passage being read in scripture. This should catch your attention. There's a lot here at this threshold where the celestial signs are coming together and where they're bringing things to mind patterns. It's lining up in so many ways we've seen before with the biblical calendar. This is not accidental. This is not coincidental. This should catch our attention. In this collection of passages that is being read this week, particularly this upcoming Sabbath, is entitled Go. And it's about of when Pharaoh told the people to go. Get out of here. But it's an amazing passage. Chapter 13 and 14. 14 is going to be read next week. Take time. Read these passages of what happened during that time where it got to the point Pharaoh told him, Go and serve your God. Get out of here. It's an incredible picture because this is the Passover time and when they left Egypt, but it's also a time when God told them he was going to give them a sign, a memorial, a token, and that was going to be the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Verse 9, And it shall be for a sign unto thee upon thine hand, and for a memorial between thine eyes, that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. For with a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. And he told him, this is a memorial to help you remember what I did in bringing you out of Egypt. In verse 14 and 15, he says, this is to remind you that you've been redeemed. You are a redeemed people. This unleavened bread is going to be a memorial to remind you. So you don't forget, you were redeemed. You were brought out of bondage. Definitely read this chapter. Incredible. And especially more so when we see it being read this week here, the story of Exodus. When the redeemed people were led out of Egypt and at the same time he was giving them a token of redemption, the Feast of Unleavened Bread to remind them that they were redeemed. This fits in with some other patterns we see at this time too. But then next week, the scripture reading concludes that with the crossing of the Red Sea. Exodus 15. And this is incredible because this is just after they've crossed the Red Sea and the Song of Miriam. And definitely read it. We don't have time to go over here, but they're praising God for leading them out of Egypt, how he is their strength and song and their salvation. Praising God that he led his redeemed people out. Especially verse 16. We got to read that. Fear and dread shall fall upon them by the greatness of thine arm. They shall be as still a stone till thy people pass over, O Lord. Till the people pass over, which thou hast purchased. A purchased people. A redeemed people. Being led out of bondage. Passing over. And this is being read at this time where we have the patterns of crossing over. The Exodus, the crossing of the Jordan, this crossing place, all of this coming together here. There are a lot of patterns, memorials, tokens, remembrances that were put into place to help us remember. And as we watch and we take note of these patterns and we investigate and we diligently seek, how do these all come together? When we learn more about these different pictures and patterns and shadows and we learn more about them, we can see how they go together. And then we can see celestial events that bring it all to remembrance. And we realize how it applies to where we are right now. Where the celestial signs come together. Where the calendar events come together. Where the geopolitical events come together. A lot will only be brought back to our remembrance if we remember what we sought out. And we researched and we investigated. And this is why we had to go through the learning journey. Because we had to do some serious catching up on what a lot of these pictures meant. But as we did so, we learned so many nuggets of treasure about our own tapestry of redemption. When we look at this 
pattern of timing of events and how it overlays with where we are right now. Just like the wise men, they were asked, when did you first see the star? What events surrounded that that led you on your journey? And in the same way, we have that same perspective where we are here too, because we realize our journey has been about a year and six months and some right now. And we can look back at what started our journey. And we can realize that event, the very first star, eventually combined with the second star, is what pointed us to the fast of Esther, the commemoration at the time of Purim. And right from there, the Lord opened our eyes to a lot of the other celestial events that were going on at that same time that we just weren't aware of. And it really just blew us away when we realized, wow, this is an incredibly rich celestial sign going on right here. We took note about it. We jotted down what we were seeing. We didn't understand it all. We learned a lot more very recently about the importance of these celestial events. But it caught our attention. We wrote down what we saw. And we definitely knew this was a significant milestone on our journey that related back to the very first star of Bethlehem that we did see. And now we're at an opposition marker point, a place of crossing, that calls exactly to memory what happened at the last opposition point that was connected to the first time we saw the star. All that's being brought back up here. The events that we saw that are so important are also connected to the first star. These two pile of stones are connected. Seeing the star the first time is an important milestone in retrospect looking back. And we've talked about Jupiter opposition, a very important celestial marker in the Shiloh sign, and really triggered a whole investigation into the threads of the tapestry of redemption. And what all is coming together with the pictures that are being rehearsed? What are being pointed to by these celestial signs? What's the story behind Shiloh, the prophecy, the events, the characters involved, down throughout history, astronomy? Incredible, so many threads that the Lord has shown us the depth of his workings throughout time bringing us to a place on this treasure hunt where we've learned so many things and we're at a place now where a lot of it's coming together, but we had to have that investigative perspective first. Now, Jupiter opposition, we talked about, was surrounded and bookended on either side by the fast of Esther, the commemorative event, but also the original event, which happened at Passover time. And it caught our attention how these were synchronized with Jupiter opposition when it was at its brightest right at the hind foot of the lion. And you'll remember the first two star of Bethlehem's, the equidistant point on a cyclical counter pointing us exactly to the fast of Esther, which was a day before Purim started. And on the first day of Purim, the moon was full. And then the next day, the moon was lined up with Jupiter, which you can see here in this Stellarium shot here. Very close. Definitely caught our attention. And especially when we consider the two-star Bethlehem signs, how they were very strong reminders of the king coming. And then we were seeing, and we were just getting a beginning introduction to the Shiloh prophecy at that time, what the whole picture even was about. And then to see that with Jupiter, the lion, and the moon, which often pictures the bride, that was a very high time of expectation. But then the Lord showed us how the knowledge pointing to this point segued right into the larger celestial sign of Jupiter at opposition. One thread directed us to an even larger thread in tapestry. Jupiter at opposition, again, when it was brightest, right near the hind foot of the lion, astronomically got our attention. You could see it out in the sky with your naked eye. And it was also at the time of a total solar eclipse, too. There was so much coming together in just these few days here. We know this time was so important. We're still learning how it was so important. But there's a lot of patterns and shadows with Passover and Esther and Purim and all that that happened right in this window, right between these two bookend events with Jupiter and the moon. And so when we come to where we are now, we are reminded of what happened at this place of crossing. So this became our first pile of stones, where is heavily impressed upon us by the celestial signs that pointed us to even find out about this place of crossing. But then what happened there, too? celestially, prophetically, on the calendar. This was very important, and we took a lot of notes about it, and we've been learning so much about it. And so now we're at a lookout place, another place of crossing that will happen in the future, but it is the same place, where we can look back in the past and we could see the first pile of stones, so to speak. We could see the pile of patterns, the pile of shadows and events that were coming together at that time, and we are reminded Hey, I remember when we were there and everything that happened there because we're in a similar pile of stones right here. 
We're at another place of crossing just like we were there. That one was important. This one is important. Again, just like crossing the Jordan. Two memorials. One a memorial that pointed to a marker. And that's what we have now is we're at a crossing place that reminds us of a true crossing when Jupiter was at opposition and that started the Omega portion. And now we're at a place of where the transition will be between the Alpha and Omega, but it's still in the future. But we're at a place where it will happen. And so it rehearses what has happened in the past at a crossing place and what will happen in the future. And so this is what we see coming together here. Incredible celestial signs, remembrances of the pile of stones, the celestial pile of stones, so to speak, that we were shown before and pointed to and had our attention drawn to and circled and had so many celestial events saying, this is important, take a note of it. You will understand it better later, though. And here, many months later, we have learned so much. We've come so far on our learning journey. The Lord has shown us so much and given us so much wisdom. And we could see how we are at an important time right here on our learning journey. Reminded of the first time we saw the star, which got us going on our journey. And we are at a time of great expectation. Now, looking at the crossing of the Jordan again, we have mentioned that they observed Passover, then the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then it strongly appears, because they're camped right next to Jericho, that the attack on Jericho started right after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, someone brought up the question of, the Bible tells us that the men were circumcised when they crossed Jordan. On that day, they were circumcised. But when you count the number of days from that event to when they started the attack on Jericho, is enough time to heal up. And for an adult, it takes about two weeks. And that's what most of them will say, about two weeks, they're ready to go. But we also consider... Joshua knew the first six days of the attack on Jericho, they were just going to be walking around the city anyway. They weren't going to be doing any strenuous activity. So from the time of crossing toward the final attack, they had two and a half weeks to recover. So plenty of time. So we have very strong reason to believe the walking attack around Jericho started right after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But we can't state that definitively, but it appears right away, especially since they were camped right next to their enemy. And so we keep that in consideration with that pattern at this time, too, because we've talked about in the time of perplexity, that pattern is used and relates to the tribulation, the tribulation spiral of time. And I want to highly encourage you to download these resources, print them out, because you will refer to them quite often. I keep a copy of the Shiloh booklet right here on my desk next to me, and I refer to it quite often. There is a lot of information in these booklets. But we also see within this pattern is the Feast of Unleavened Bread that relates to the token memorial that God gave them to remind them that they were a redeemed people brought out of bondage. This was another memorial. In a sense, this was another pile of stones. And this is what we see coming together. Multiple types of tokens, multiple types of memorials, different types of remembrances that were given throughout time to keep certain pictures alive that would be valuable in the future knowledge. And then we are reminded that at this same time, at Passover, which segued right into the Feast of Unleavened Bread, this is when Christ gave his disciples a new covenant, a new testament, using the unleavened bread, which from the Hebrew perspective they already knew, that reminded them that they were a redeemed people. They were brought out of bondage. They were a purchased people. He used that bread, which was already a memorial that they were a redeemed people. And he was reminding them that he's going to take it to a whole new level. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. These pictures, which he's adding new emphasis to and new pictures to and new meaning to, which have a deep history going back to Exodus and the passing over and the redemption and bringing out of bondage and the passing over. This memorial, disciples, is going to be in remembrance of me, of how I am going to become your Passover lamb. I am going to redeem you. I'm going to pay your price to purchase you and to bring you out of bondage. This do ye as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. This pattern, this picture, this token, this memorial, this remembrance, which goes back to Egypt, the redemption, the Passover lamb, the crossing over, 
These same pictures relate to how one day he is going to come again for his redeemed people, and he will lead them out of bondage. Exodus 13 rehearses how this bread was given to remind them they were a redeemed people, brought out of bondage, and they left Egypt. They made an exodus. They made a departure. They made a falling away from Pharaoh. And God led them through the Red Sea. And in Exodus 15, we find them singing a song, the song of Miriam, praising the Lord, their strength and song. In verse 16, Till thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over, which thou hast purchased. The people whom the Lord has purchased, singing a new song. Does this ring any bells? Ephesians 1.12 That we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, and to the praise of his glory. The redemption of the purchased possession. That is what we are. We are awaiting the redemption, the pickup of the purchased possession. And one day we will sing a new song as we are gathered around the throne before the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb of God who is slain on our behalf. Verse 9, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. We are awaiting the redemption of the purchased possession, to be led out of bondage, till his people pass over, till his people pass over, and then one day we will sing a new song. And this is what we are to remember, till he comes. We see so many patterns and celestial signs and prophetic events and geopolitical events. We see even the enemy activity, knowing this time is very important. We see so many patterns that are brought to our remembrance as memorials of what we should remember and what we should take heed to as we go forward in our learning journey, seeing how it all comes together with these signs and the events telling us that we are at a place of crossing. We are at a time where we should have expectation of passing over. We are at a time where we have expectation of our bridegroom, the one who has redeemed us and purchased us, returning to pick up his bride. These next few days, this very next few days are highly, highly important. Right in the midst of all these patterns that are coming together here. There is a lot we don't know, but we go forward on what we do know. The promises of God, seeing what has come together, looking at all the nuggets that we have already found. Seeing it all come together, these patterns, and as we study them more, we learn more about them and the importance of this time. So we will continue to watch as we go forward, but these next few days and hours are extremely important. Let us be found watching and looking with expectation for our bridegroom. Hebrews 11.6 But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Let us diligently seek him, asking, Where is he? Where is he? Revelation 22.12 And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. We are at a place that reminds us of the Alpha and Omega, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and how he is returning and he is coming quickly and he wants to reward those who are diligently seeking him, those who diligently live as though he is returning. Let us take this to heart. Let us rise up. Let us trim our lamps. Let us trim our life, our heart, our mind, our strength, our soul, and let us go out to meet the bridegroom, serving Jesus Christ first and highest above all else. Maranatha.